Welcome to Gaming on a Budget. Tonight we'll be taking a look at Rococo from Eggert Spiel and Eagle Games, and I apologize if Eggert Spiel is not pronounced Eggert Spiel. I uh, don't speak a great deal of German. Rococo is a Euro building game. Now by that I mean that it combines elements of a deck builder with cards that you will progressively gain over the game and cards you will remove to improve the pool of actions you have available to you. It's also a Euro game in the sense that you will be taking pre-designated actions along the board to accomplish your goals and score points. Euro building was a new concept to me a few months ago, but since then, well, I seem to have acquired quite a few of them. And to make a long story short, Rococo is so far my far and away favorite. It is a fantastically, fantastically well-designed game. It flows so beautifully. Now, the core mechanic would, I guess, lean closer to a deck builder in the sense that you don't really have workers you're placing or that sort of staple to a Euro game, but you do take all of your actions through cards. So in that sense, it skews, I guess, a little bit closer to a deck builder. But you'll see more of what I'm talking about when we get to how the game plays out. The basics are going to be accomplished through your starting hand of cards, which is five cards that you're going to start every game with, and each player will start with the same five cards. You're going to have apprentices, which are the, I guess you could say, least versatile of the cards, in that there are several actions along the board marked with their cheap thimble symbol, there's a tongue twister for you, that uh, they simply cannot take. They can never recruit other employees, by which I mean new cards for your deck. They can never make dresses, and they can never acquire the queen's favor. Now, then you have journeymen. They are like a step up from an apprentice. They have some more options available for them to take, but they're not quite as versatile as a master. There are several dresses they simply cannot make, and they cannot recruit other workers. Again, the deck building aspect. Finally, you have the masters. The masters can do anything at all, anything you want. So. Why would you ever want to buy a card other than a master? Well, I'll tell you. If you look along the bottom of the cards here, you will notice different symbols in the bottom half of the card. These are the abilities that each card carries with it when you play it. Essentially, they're going to allow you to take a second action. This apprentice here, for example, after, and only after, that's very important, you take his primary action, whatever you choose it to be, he can then purchase an extra piece of fabric as a free secondary action. The journeyman here may spend a coin to acquire either a silk or a lace. These are another kind of resource you're going to need to make dresses. And finally, these masters here, with the big fat X, don't do anything. So you've got your primary action, which can be anything you want it to be, and nothing else. So, it's going to continue like that through the various cards in the game. The apprentices will always have the most powerful secondary actions, but they're limited with their primaries. So it's kind of a trade-off how you want to build your deck. One extremely pivotal fact to this game, though, and I believe they even mention it in the rulebook, 
never, ever, ever get rid of all of your masters. They're the only one that can hire other people. Get rid of them all and <laughs> you're not getting any more. So I'm going to advise against that. Now, I mentioned making dresses. As you, I guess, may not be aware, the theme of this game is that you are the owner of a dressmaking company in, I believe it's 15th century France, though I could be horribly wrong on that, who uh, is helping to prepare for an elaborate party that King Louis XV, again, I could be wrong on the details, uh, is throwing. So, you're going to be making dresses, both for sale and for rent, and that's an important distinction we'll cover momentarily. Uh, you're going to be hiring more workers to deal with your sudden volume of work here. I mean, this is the party of the century, and you're a party guy. So, well, a party-making-happen guy. Anyway, uh, you're also going to be building decorations. Though you yourself are not building them, you're financing the creation of the decorations. And the term decoration is a little bit of a misnomer since you'll also be financing, say, musicians and the like. But, as I understand it, it was the closest they could get with the translation of the German word they had originally used. So, what we're going to look at next is the various ways you are going to score points in this game. One of the primary ways is making dresses and suits. As you can see, each one has a primary color. This is a green suit. This is a yellow suit. Shocking, I know. Uh, fabric requirements, which will be the colored uh, rolls of fabric, whatever you call them. Bolts of fabric. Yes, my lovely camera wife has corrected my terminology there. Uh, then you've got the secondary requirement in the form of either silk or lace. That may be a little hard to see. We'll let her zoom in there. You got that, honey? Yeah? No? Yes. Okay. Secondary requirement in the form of silk and lace. You're going to need all of those things to make the outfit, but you can overpay, essentially. You just don't get change. Now, how are you going to pay for these outfits? Well, you will be acquiring fabrics. As you can see, this fabric tile here has the two yellows you need to make this dress. It also has a red. Hmm. So, you'd kind of have to make a bit of a decision there. Do you sacrifice the extra red, because you won't be getting change, to make this dress, or do you hold on to this tile in the hopes you could get a closer match? There are a wide variety of color combinations in this game, so finding an exact match is not impossible. But, you know, that's a decision you're going to have to make. Points now, or potentially better match later. Once you have constructed an outfit, you're going to have to decide if you want to sell it for its indicated coin value down there in the uh, bottom left corner or rent it for end game points. Selling dresses and suits is the single largest source of money you will have in this game and you will use a lot of money. So it's not always going to be easy to decide which you want to do. But let's say you chose to rent these outfits out. You flip them over to their reverse side. Notice you've gotten rid of the currency and fabric requirements. Uh, and then you will place them in the frames present on the board, like so. Certain frames will have bonuses. This one will get you a free fabric tile of your choice. This one will get you three coins, and so on. You'll also notice that some of the frames have gilded edges and a golden master thimble underneath. This doesn't mean that a dress has to have the master thimble. It just has to be made by a master. So, 
how do you have a dress made by a master? Well, you remember my mentioning your cards earlier. If you use a master card to take the dress making action, that dress is considered to be made by a master. You're not going to indicate that in any way, excepting that you could, at your discretion, place that dress when rented within a gilded frame. So, finally, before I show you some of how the game plays out, let's take a look at how the deck building aspect will work and how you will determine your starting hand. In this game, they have removed the random factor to deck building in that uh, you will be starting with these five cards and you will be choosing three of them from, for your initial hand. This is going to be a very important decision because the cards left over will automatically go into your new hand. As your deck gets larger, you'll be able to pick your hand of three cards until you get down to the last few, which you will have to take. You'll then flip over your discard pile and acquire the remaining cards. So, let's say, for example, that I took both masters in my starting hand. That would enable me to take two master level actions but, for my next hand, I have to take these two, so I'd only be able to pick one from the discard pile, which would be flipped over into my uh, starting hand pile. Then, on the turn thereafter, I would see the same thing happen, where I would have those two cards and be able to pick one of these. As your deck grows, there will be situations where, if you choose a lot of masters at once, you won't have any for the next round, which can be very painful because some of the cards that will be coming out each round are just fantastic cards and you're sitting there going, oh man, I wish I could buy that. Now, the way the deck building aspect is going to work is when you play a master too higher, you'll pay a cost indicated along the side of the board, which is based on how many workers remain to potentially be hired. Five coins if there's all four there, three if there's three, and so on. Uh, and the cost may differ depending on whether you're playing a two to three or four to five player game, because there's a different, it's a two-sided board with less spaces, obviously, on the two to three player side. So, if you used a master to hire one of these guys, let's say this nice journeyman here, he would go directly into your hand. What that means is you're going to have an extra action for that round because you've got an extra card in your hand. And it goes around in a clockwise circle from the starting player until everyone is out of cards. So if you hire a lot of people in a round, you could end up taking two, three, well, for more actions than anyone else. If, for example, you used your master to hire another master, you could then use that master on your next turn to hire yet another person. But the flip side is, A, other people are going to want some of those cards too, likely as not, and B, Mass hiring means that you're giving everyone else a chance to do all the other stuff you can do in a round first. But you can figure out the strategies for yourself. In the meantime, uh, you'll be acquiring money. You have a default income of five coins per round with the fountain decoration potentially providing more. Wait, decorations? Yeah. Let's cover decorations. Those are kind of important. Decorations are anything that has the uh, little silver frame symbol around its coin cost. You'll see them all over the board. Decorations are something that can be built by playing a card, as with everything else, and paying the indicated coin cost. And each decoration has a different function. The fountain can provide income in various ways. The top level will provide it based on how many total decorations you've built, and the bottom level will provide it based on how many dresses you've rented. 
statues will give a point bonus at the end based on how many different colors of outfit you've created and rented. Uh, the fireworks will provide a multiplier bonus to people in this row. Mm. The way that's going to work is after you've scored the floor majority for this floor, because each floor has a majority point value, you will then be able to choose people to move up to fireworks you have built, at which time you will multiply their point value. There's also uh, point bonuses for getting one person in each floor first, starting at the top and then working down, obviously. Um, and you are restricted on the fountain to one building per floor, so you couldn't just build the whole fountain and deny everyone else income. Uh, let's see, you'll track your score with these happy little tokens here. Nothing terribly exciting there. So, without further ado, let's take a look at how this will all actually play out. Okay, so what we've got here is a sample of a game in play. Now, we're probably a turn or two in at this point. A few outfits have been built, some decorations, and the game is well underway. So, let's say then that we have the green player who has the following cards in his hand. He has two masters and a journeyman. And Hmm, he's got three outfits on the board. He's only two outfits away from claiming the uh, bonus points for having uh, someone on every floor. He's also got the fountain space that gives him bonus income based on the number of outfits. So he's probably going to try and do some more, some more heavy duty dress building. He wants to keep up his momentum here claim that early bonus because as you can see it's a lot larger than the second bonus and you know score some of the best spaces on the board and just lock in his majorities so he might start out by hmm, let's see what fabric he's got at the moment he's got ooh a yellow and a green well it does match up with this suit right here but this suit is pitiful both in points and coins so he'd like to try and aim a little higher if he can. So I think what he's going to do is play out his journeyman here. His journeyman will let him, in this case, purchase this double green fabric tile. Now, since the row I got it from had two fabrics in it initially, that's going to cost him one buck. So he'll put his two back, take a one, and claim his tile. For his secondary action, he has the free depute ability. Deputing is what this game calls uh, getting rid of a card. So, he will take his remaining deck of cards here and, oh man, we've had this guy since the beginning of the game. We don't need him anymore. So, we're going to go ahead and tell him his services are no longer need him and send him off to help the king or something I think is what the book says. With this particular card though, instead of getting coins for getting rid of him, because normally we'd get paid, instead of that we get to use his secondary ability one final time. So he might pay one more coin and hmm, well I tell you what I'm eyeballing both of those three green suits down there and they both need two of the white cubes so since he only has one he's going to pay a coin to get the other one he desperately needs so that will be his first turn there he's got two cards remaining in his hand he just got rid of this one we're just going to take it out of the game and this one's going to go in his discard pile over here next we'll move over to the blue player blue chose a little bit of a different breakdown he'd like to try and get somewhat of a dominance on the decorations while he can. He's purchased the fountain income space for decoration bonus income, but so far the fountain space is his only decoration, so he's not making very much money yet. 
Now, most of the decorations are tremendously expensive. We are talking, you know, 20, 25, 30 coins, 12 to 22 coins. But the musicians, particularly the ones in the smaller rooms, are cheap and they're kind of a secondary tiebreaker, with the primary tiebreaker being most gilded spaces. So, they're also worth a good amount of points individually. So what he's going to start out doing is, he's going to, I think he'll play his apprentice, since decorations are one of the few things an apprentice can do. So he's going to play out his apprentice, He's going to pick a musician, let's say this one here, for eight coins. He will put back his eight coins, take one of his player control, oops, yeah, player control markers, set it on the musician here, and that one is now his. As a secondary, he can purchase a fabric swatch, so let's see, what has he got right now? Ooh. He has an exact match to this guy right here. So, oh my goodness, he is very excited about that. He is going to, he's going to go ahead and take a blue fabric. Even though it's going to cost him $2, blue is the rarest color in the game. So he'd definitely like to lock in another one since he'll be using his only one soon. So that one will cost him two coins, which he will pay for. And then that will be his action. Play will pass back over to Green. Green now is looking at continuing his dressmaking extravaganza. Both of his remaining cards are masters, and his, uh, his fabrics are lined up now with uh, these two green suits that are worth three points apiece. That's not bad. That's fairly middle of the road. Uh, what he's going to do is play out his master here to make this suit. Why this one? Well, even though the requirements are the same, he wants to deny Blue the huge, huge 22 coins Blue could get by making and selling this suit. He's not as concerned about decorations right now, so he's not going to sell it, but he wants to make sure Blue doesn't get a chance to do so. The other identical suit is only worth 15 coins, so leaving that one behind makes more sense. So what he's going to do is take his three greens, discard those, discard his two white cubes here, and he's definitely going to rent this out. He sees Blue making a move on this room right here, and he needs it to claim his one person in each floor bonus, so he's going to place him somewhere in this room. And it's a trickier choice than you might think, because he did build this suit with a master, so he can claim one of the important gilded frames, but at the same time, he'd really like that three coin bonus. I mean, that's coins for nothing. Still, just to make sure he maintains control, which is very important to his points, he's going to put that suit right in there. So now he puts his master in the discard pile, sets his hand over here, and passes the play over to Blue. Ooh, whoops, that Blue played this last turn. Okay, so... Uh, what we're going to do from here is take his fabric tiles and, uh, sorry, the camera wife was uh, signaling important secret things to me there. Uh, what we're going to do with him is take his fabric tiles here and, hmm, he doesn't have to use a master to make this dress. Despite its huge amount of points, it doesn't have the golden thimble, so he could actually make it with his journeyman. Which I think he'll go ahead and do. He's gonna play it with his journeyman. He'll take the two fabrics and a white and a gray, discard them, and wow, 21 bucks. 
given his uh, his decoration goal, it would make sense to sell this. But five points is the most any single outfit is worth. So he's going to he's going to. I'm oh, sorry. What, sweetie? You have to pay for the dress spaces. Oh, wow. Thank you, sweetie. Uh, my beautiful and insightful camera wife has pointed out that I forgot to mention that you pay money for the outfit, too, based on which space you, uh, you take it from. So, taking an outfit from here would cost you three coins, or here, eight coins. And at the end of the round, Anything left over in a zero space gets taken off the board, everything gets pushed down, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so, having built this massive, massive five point red dress, Blue is... Blue's gonna try and work on securing the top floor. It's worth a lot of points and he's... he's got a foothold there already. So, he's gonna put his dress in this space, which has the free fabric tile symbol. That means he gets to pick any one of the remaining tiles and just take it, free of charge. He really likes the versatility of this one. Three different colors is very useful. He may end up wasting some of them, but it'll help him complete a dress regardless of what color is involved. So, that should kind of give you an idea how this game is going to flow. You have many actions to choose from. You can acquire the queen's favor with a journeyman or a master, you know, which will get you five coins or on the final round three points, and it gives you the first player uh, invitation envelope here. You could hire workers, you could, you know, get fabrics and lace and silk and decorations and, you know, there's, there's really a good amount of stuff going on here but there's not so much going on that the game is difficult to teach, which is an issue I've had with some of the meteor euros. Not that this one doesn't have some definite significance to it, but it's, I would call it, a medium difficulty. It's not, you know, a Lahav or anything like that. It also has a medium play length, too, which is nice. Uh, so, that gives you a basic idea how the game plays out. Um, now, there's a lot of stuff I didn't show you, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can see in other ways, you know, or get the game. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, time is money, all that good stuff, things to do. So, uh, so let's uh, go head on to my final opinion here. Okay, so this game just, it flows fantastically. It is, there is never a dull moment. People's turns tend to proceed fast enough and be interesting enough to watch that you're never bored. It combines so many mechanics and aspects like that into a single game. You've got area majority, you've got uh, Euro style play, you've got deck building. I mean, there's so much going on here, but it all flows together so incredibly well. It is it is a masterful, masterful piece of game design. It plays amazingly with all the player counts we've tried it with, and I think we've tried it with all player counts at this point. Uh, it's just fantastic. I mean, it, due to the difference in the boards for the two and three player with the, or, and the four and five player with the number of spaces available, you always feel the right amount of crowded. You know, it's you can't just la di da through the game and expect to get all the spaces you want. But at the same time, it doesn't feel like this mad, desperate rush, which can be fun at times, but would really just destroy the flow of this game. And I know I've said flow a lot, but it really just is the best way to describe this game. It just goes so smoothly. Uh, 
there are a few little minor complaints I have to it. Things like, even though you need to randomize the dresses and the fabrics, they only gave you one bag for some reason. Uh, you know, I improvised this happy little crown royal bag. Um, but it's just little things like that. Nothing even really worth mentioning for the most part. You now it's the art is just fantastic. My wife and I both just adore this style. It feels like a like a world without end, pillars of the earth kind of thing, but with, as my wife puts it, more saturation. But she's the artist. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Don't blame me if it doesn't. Uh, you know, it just it's great. We love it with two players. We love it with three players, four players. I mean, it, it's fantastic. And on a side note, I got this as part of a Kickstarter project Eagle Games put on, and oh, they were just fantastic to deal with. Rick and Hannah, just wonderful, wonderful people to deal with. If you're ever considering an Eagle Games project, definitely, definitely contact them with any questions. They're just fantastic to deal with. Uh, I've got to find some more words. <laughs> I feel like I'm repeating myself a bit much. Anyway, so this is Rococo. I would seriously, seriously recommend giving it a shot if any of this looked even remotely appealing because it is so much more fun to play than it is to watch videos. Uh, it's going for around eh, 50 bucks, give or take, at the moment, and it is worth every penny. It is phenomenal. So, this is Rococo. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and play some games already. Quit watching videos. Get off your computer. Jeez.